Coming face to face with anything that ignites strong emotions is hard. I've had to face the music countless times in my life, but nothing compares to the past few months. On August 13th, while living with a coworker and her boyfriend, I was sexually assaulted in my home. To tell my story accurately, let's rewind to when I was younger. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. My parents, aunts, and uncles lived with my grandparents on and off. I grew up under the apostolic Christian influence. I resonated with my belief in my preteen years, but by my teen years, my mind began surfacing more. I questioned not only my belief, but my sexuality, and knew one day I'd have to find myself. I left the state when I was 17 and came to California to pursue a new life where I had my own voice and could create my own identity. I attended San Diego Job Corps, which provided on-campus living throughout my stay. I exited the program at 19, went off to college, and moved into an apartment with an associate's friend. This was my first roommate ever, and what an introduction to adult life it was. I left two months later and moved to San Ysidro to rent a room. Fast forward to six and a half years, 14 moves, and countless roommates later. Many of my roommates were poorly chosen out of desperation. Once I moved in with them, their true colors showed. In 2015, I had just moved to Imperial Beach into an apartment with a couple. I was co-workers with the girlfriend and told her I was staying at a shelter. I wanted to move out and get my own place, and she needed help with rent, so it was perfect. Over time, however, as I went to work and school, things grew sour. My roommate began cheating on her boyfriend while he was away working for three months. I was friends with the person she was cheating with, but I broke off ties with this person after he used the N-word towards me. She didn't give up and had him over countless times after I told her no. Eventually, it got to the point where things could reach confrontation, so I sought out advice and comfort. My mistake was seeking it through the internet and having them over my apartment after the first day of meeting. One day, my roommates and I were all home together when I told them. I said, well, I have good news, sorta. Why sorta? I got laid, but now I have to go to the doctor to do an STD and STI checkup. Why, what for? Something happened recently. I went to someone's house and a few days ago, he sexually assaulted me. They showed little concern, saying things like, that sucks, or yeah, you should go to the doctor. They never talked about it again and never saw if I was recovering. I was a wreck figuring out how to cope with the situation and a possible HIV diagnosis. Their attitude, along with other minor incidents, built enough of a motive for me to leave and be in a more considerate environment. I went on leave from work and a few days later moved out. This led to me moving in with a classmate during the fall semester of that year. He and his grandfather rented out a small shack connected to a house. I was sleeping there, but would be gone during the day because his grandfather didn't know I was there. I was sleeping under the bed, a decision that I rejected until I realized I'd have to spend the remaining of the semester on the streets if not. At the time, I thought I'd stay there until I at least got a job and some money saved. I realized my semester pass would expire and told him I would have to move sooner because where he lived made it hard to get to school, and I didn't have money to catch the bus that was just outside. He had a car, but he wasn't willing to drive me out of the house in the morning. I felt like I was already living on the streets since I was forced to remain gone all day which disallowed me to eat or take showers sometimes. I moved out two weeks before the year ended and was in sorrow because being homeless is how I began that year. I found myself attempting to stay next to the main points of transportation and the library downtown. I made relationships with people I didn't want to because it was a way of establishing myself and have someone watch over my belongings if ever I had to go somewhere during the day or night. It helped me that I didn't know three people from the streets that I stayed on which is what led me there. Unless you're into drug and rape culture, LTBG bashing, shaming, alcoholism, gangs, homicide, constant stealing, lying, cheating, and bribing, you wouldn't make it with many of these people. All I could do is watch or sleep through it as the city tirelessly built and cleaned around us to preserve the look and feel of downtown, ignoring the homelessness issue. All I could do was sleep in the storm and inhale the heroin and methamphetamine smoke that I tried to find, that I tried to mind my own business or sleep and watch over my stuff. While living on the streets, I lost $100 that was borrowed from me by a friend who'd helped me when I was homeless almost two years prior. He supposedly came from out of town and was staying with someone who needed $100 for rent soon. I didn't expect him not to pay me back. 
He deleted his Facebook and I couldn't reach him through phone. I knew as long as he remained in San Diego, I would have to see him again and have to face him. On January 13th, two days before my birthday, I was sleeping in my tent when I woke up suddenly and overheard two guys talking about waking someone up, getting something that was taken, and finding out what happened. My tent was unzipped and a guy poked in and grabbed my sleeping bag, shaking me and saying, get up. He asked, where's my bike and where's my money? He was with someone I knew from a program I attended for homeless and foster youth. This guy confirmed I was the one and they were both claiming that I had a bike and money taken. They left after I kept saying that I didn't have anything. Outside, however, I could hear them near my tent discussing who I was and what they were looking for. They then returned to my tent. It seemed set up. I think someone was sending them my direction. They began punching me in the head and dragging me out of the tent. I called two other guys on the block out for help. My attackers searched my pockets while pinning me to the ground. They grabbed my wallet and let go of me. I got up to retrieve it, but suddenly there were more people around. The guy holding the wallet wanted me to fight him to get it back, but he gave it back and took $12. I took, I took my backpack, but then they took it, and it had a lot of personal information inside. The guys I called out for help watched the whole time. I walked off to seek help and was taken to the hospital. A police officer visited me in the hospital an hour later to get my story. When I came face to face with the officer and reported the incident, it was emotional and exhausting. I told her to send for an officer to retrieve my tent, sleeping bag, and a few items left behind in my tent. I found out days later that the officer didn't find my belongings. I never got the rest of my stuff back. I was living in fear of walking on certain blocks at certain times, and I've had to sever ties with the people I was around because they affiliate with people very close to my attackers. Then I thought about how one of my attackers was someone I'd housed for a day two years prior, letting him shower, sleep, and even wear some of my clothes and wash and dry. The pain had gotten heavier. I was battling to fight them in self-defense because I'm nonviolent in my belief, and I was struggling with what to do with my case. Should I report them? I felt the same way with the guy who sexually assaulted me, though the case could never be further investigated since the way it happened isn't classified as a crime enough for conviction. Am I being nonviolent if I press charges? Is this a peaceful resolve as my major peace studies has taught me? Throughout both assaults and my homelessness, I felt forlorn because I only knew a few people who took the time out to help me, and my family was still broken apart. However, the few people who did help me didn't remain in my life long enough to see me well or only address the issues once. I found myself initiating conversations and reminding people why I was still sad or upset. It was a shocking experience to have people around me who knew things were serious but hardly made an effort to see their supposed friend progress. I do have one friend named Kevin who remained in my life through my crisis and I'm grateful for his presence. I finally got to speak with a detective and identify one of the assailants. I couldn't ID the other assailant because I have an idea of what he looks like. I don't want them to learn their lesson through some extreme punishment. For me, I want them to know I could have died had they hit me in the right place. I hope out of this that they have guidance to help them to leave their self-destructive ways behind. I know that there are deeper issues to address internally within them due to my insight and my empathy. Another incident I got to resolve peacefully is the $100 taken. Just a few days after I was beaten, I bumped into the guy and came face to face. He's a foster youth too, and I told him that I never knew that he was capable of that. I told him he put me in a hole and that if I were anyone else, he would have been beaten, so to be careful. He apologized and said he told me he wasn't a good person, as if I should have known better. He said he never meant for that to happen and would pay me. I told him I wasn't over it, but I was over it, and that he was still in the age group to receive benefits from programs out there and didn't have to steal from people. I walked away and it felt good, like I had passed the level. I was receiving some counseling for my sexual assault, but I found a place to receive the counseling permanently. I'm also taking on finding a job to end my homelessness. My homelessness made me feel forced to find another job, whether or not I was healed from the trauma, but I didn't because my school major stresses the harm we cause as humans to ourselves and the earth, and I didn't want to work for a company that perpetuated the extreme climate change we're going through, but as a result, I martyred myself. I was living outside, enduring for a cause and a belief while hoping to heal in a very self-destructive environment. 
I tell my story because I know we hear often about men being the offenders in sexual assault, but they are victims too and the most silent victims. Topics like this need to be addressed, so more of it isn't considered groundbreaking when it is. I'm not used to or good with coming face to face with anything because of my mental and physical reactions and sensitivities that follow. As I grow and live longer, I find it easier to confront things immediately, if not almost immediately, and speak my mind and say no. These lessons will keep repeating themselves until I learn from them, so I'm pressing forward to be bold, pronounced in my identity, goals, inner worth, and desires while moving on. I am attending school still and plan to no matter what until I graduate. Although it's been extremely hard for me to laugh and find joy in the same things again, I refuse to give up and will remold myself into a more refined version of me. T.C. Wade.